Fractals often exemplify a straightforward yet counterintuitive principle. It's possible to generate fantastically complex structures and patterns from extremely simple rules. The Cook's snowflake is conjured up by a rule that a child could understand and yet has an elaborate albeit regular structure. The Mandelbrot set is vastly more complex but again springs from a disarmingly simple recipe of instructions. You start with the function z squared plus c and by examining properties and asking questions arrive at a fractal that has bewildering complexity looking completely different at different points. Using a computer as a microscope it's possible to zoom in on any part of the Mandelbrot set and discover pattern within pattern never exactly repeating and never reaching an end. Fractals have one other interesting property. The fractal dimension of the Koch snowflake as we've seen is 1.26. If we take an arbitrary line that intersects the Koch snowflake, the intersection is almost always itself a fractal with dimension 0.26. There are a few degenerate cases such as a line of symmetry which results in two isolated points for a fractal dimension of zero. This is true for any fractal with dimension between one and two inclusive. For example, almost all lines that intersect the boundary of the Mandelbrot set form a fractal with dimension one, though they consist of disconnected points and have length zero. If we consider the same with fractals of dimension less than one, something else happens. These fractals all consist of a cloud of isolated points. An example is Fatu dust. The surprising result is that almost all lines that intersect Fatu dust do so at only one single point for a fractal dimension of zero, while almost all lines in general even if restricted to those passing through the Fatu dust, will never intersect it. These fractals all exist in two-dimensional space. We can even go down to one-dimensional space and find fractals consisting of disconnected clouds of points and having a fractal dimension of one or less. The most famous example is the Cantor set. Start by taking a line segment Remove the middle third, leaving two separate line segments. Do the same over and over again. In the end, all line segments have been reduced to disconnected points that comprise a fractal with a fractal dimension of approximately 0.63. Fractals are closely related to another phenomenon in mathematics known as chaos. The word itself is Greek and in its original form meant void or emptiness. In classical and mythological notions of creation it was the formless state out of which the universe emerged. In maths and physics chaos or a chaotic state is equivalent to randomness or lack of pattern. But chaos theory is different from all these and refers to the behavior of non-linear dynamic systems under certain conditions. The behavior of the weather gives a familiar example. Nowadays we can easily forecast the weather in the short term over a few days or a week and get it right much of the time. But there are no reliable forecasts for longer time scales such as a month. That's because of chaos. Suppose we take the weather starting from a particular initial condition. We can compute the forecast into the future from those conditions. However, if we change the conditions at the start by even a minuscule amount, the weather will very soon become unrecognizably different. This fact is what led to the discovery of chaos in the first place by the American mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz. In the 1950s, Lorenz was working on a mathematically simplified model of the weather. He plugged in numbers into his computer and generated a graph, but was interrupted in mid-computation and had to restart the program. Instead of going back to the very start, which would have taken too much time, he started at a point in the middle and input the results from there. 
The graph he got at first seemed to agree with his previous one, but soon rapidly diverged, as if it were a completely different graph. The reason was that a computer stores a few more digits than it outputs for rounding purposes. When Lorenz restarted the program, those digits were lost, so the input was imperceptibly different from the initial result at that point. The difference was amplified by the program until it diverged rapidly. This gave rise to a principle that Lorenz called the butterfly effect, a reference to the fact that if a butterfly flapped its wings today, it might lead to a hurricane a month later. Simpler equations than those used to predict the weather can show this same effect. Let's say we start off with some value of x, where x can take any value between and including 0 and 1. Then we multiply x by 1 minus x, and also by a constant number k, where k is between 1 and 4 inclusive. The new value of x is cycled back into this formula again and again. In mathematical jargon, the process can be summarized as shown here. What we find is that for values of k that are less than or equal to 3, there's an attractor consisting of a single point, with every value of x, apart from 0 and 1, converging to it. For values of k between 3 and 3.45, the attractor consists of two points, which alternate. When k lies between 3.45 and 3.54, the attractor consists of four points, then eight, and so on, doubling more and more often. At approximately k equal to 3.57, a big change takes place, and the doubling goes from happening faster and faster to happening an infinite number of times. At this point, the system can never settle down to a steady pattern and becomes completely chaotic. The doubling of attractor points is governed by an important mathematical constant known as the Feigenbaum constant. The first phase with a cycle of one point has length 2 from k equals 1 to k equals 3. The second with a cycle of two points has length approximately 0.45. The ratio 2 over 0.45 is approximately 4.45. The third phase has length approximately 0.095. The ratio 0.45 over 0.095 is approximately 4.74 and so on. These ratios eventually converge to the Feigenbaum constant, 4.669 and so on. Each phase lasts exponentially shorter than the last, so that by k equals 3.57, this has occurred infinitely many times. The Feigenbaum constant emerges from the process we've just considered, but what makes it fundamental to chaos theory is that it can be found in all similar chaotic systems. No matter what the equation, as long as it satisfies some basic conditions, it will have cycles that double in length according to the Feigenbaum constant. To see how chaotic processes can generate fractals, we could take the iterative process above and plot the attractors for each k. Most of what appears after k equals 3.57 is pure chaos, but there are a few values of k for which there's a finite attractor. These are known as islands of stability. One such island occurs around k equals 3.82, where we find an attractor consisting of just three values. Zoom in on any one of these values, and what we see looks similar, though not exactly identical, to the entire graph. In his pioneering studies of chaos, Lorenz also found a new kind of fractal, known as a strange attractor. Ordinary attractors are simple, in the sense that points converge to them and then follow a fixed cycle along them. But strange attractors behave differently. Lorenz used a system of differential equations to form the first. When he zoomed in on any point on it, it gave the appearance of infinitely many parallel lines. 
Any point on the attractor followed a chaotic path along the attractor, never returning exactly to its original position, and two points that started very close to each other rapidly diverged and ended up following very different paths. For a physical analogy of this, imagine a ping-pong ball and an ocean. If the ping-pong ball is released above the ocean, it will rapidly fall until it reaches the water. If it's released below the surface, it will rapidly float up. But once it's on the ocean's surface, its motion becomes unpredictable and chaotic. Fractals are fascinating to explore and among the most photogenic objects in maths, but they're also profoundly important in the physical world. Anything in nature that appears random and irregular may be a fractal. In fact, it could be argued that everything that exists is a fractal, since it will have some structure at every level, at least down to that of an atom. Clouds, the veins in our hand, the branching of our tracheal tubes, the leaves of a tree all show a fractal structure. In cosmology, the distribution of matter across the universe is a fractal, and its structure may descend below the atomic and nuclear level, down as far as the shortest length to which any physical meaning has been ascribed, the so-called Planck length, a mere 1.6 times 10 to the minus 35 of a meter, or about 100 million trillionth the width of a proton. Fractals crop up not just in spatial patterns, but also in temporal ones. Drumming is a case in point. It's easy to program a computer to generate a rhythmic drum pattern or have a robot musician play one, but there's something about the sounds produced by professional drummers that distinguishes them from the perfectly steady, impeccably accurate beats of their synthetic counterparts. That something is the slight variations in timing and loudness, the little deviations from perfection which, research has shown, are fractal in nature. The fractal patterns differ from one drummer to another, forming part of what makes their playing distinctive. Similar patterns occur when musicians perform on other instruments and, although subtle, are the minute imperfections that separate human from machine. Because many things in the world around us are fractals or good approximations to them, a computer can quickly create a picture of something that closely resembles an object in nature, such as a tree. All it needs is a formula to work with and some starting data, and in the wink of an eye it can assemble a breathtakingly lifelike representation. Not surprisingly, then, the technique of rapidly rendering clouds, moving water, landscapes, rocks, plants, planets, and all manner of other scenery items has become a favourite of those working with CGI-enhanced movies, animated films, flight simulators, and computer games. There's no need for vast databases to hold all the objects and scenes needed to produce a realistic moving scene when the computer can calculate it all on the fly by just cycling at high speed through a few simple rules. This approach promises to play a major role in future virtual reality and other immersive technologies where the goal is to generate 3D imagery indistinguishable from the actual thing in real time.